Hello, everyone. I'm Brandon Marcello, joined alongside Michael Nyselik. This is the Auburn Undercover Podcast presented by WeHaveDonuts.com. WeHaveDonuts.com, D-O-U-G-H, Nuts.com. They're located in Birmingham, but they deliver donuts to Prevail Union Coffee Shops in Auburn and Montgomery. These are gourmet-style donuts. They also do corporate events. So check them out at WeHaveDonuts.com. These aren't your typical donuts you buy in the store or one of these other chain restaurants. Go check them out. They're a proud sponsor of the Auburn Undercover Podcast, WeHaveDonuts.com. Uh, it is a late Sunday night as we record this. Mike, we uh, spoke to both of Auburn's coordinators as Auburn gets into practices for the Peach Bowl, even though they're still working with the youngsters and not necessarily preparing for UCF right now. But they will be, it sounds like, uh, starting Monday um, when people start listening to this. But uh, the big news that came out of that, and I think the great news for Auburn's prospects of finishing with 11 wins this season is Carry on Johnson um, was not only at practice Sunday night, he practiced uh, according to Chip Lindsey. That's a good sign considering the shoulder and rib injury he was dealing with uh, in the SEC championship game just uh, two short weeks ago. And a um, remarkably different tone than Gus Malzone had. Uh, Malzone, when uh, asked about it, um, Wednesday, last Wednesday? Last week, yeah. Uh, and he said, well, you know, we're hoping to play. He'll certainly want to play. Uh, um, so, obviously, <laughs> what a difference a couple of days makes, I guess. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if he walks back that at, at any uh, – when he talks to the media this Wednesday or tries to tamper that enthusiasm that he's back to 100%. Yeah, I think the cat's out of the bag now, though I don't think uh, Gus can put it back in there. Well, remember, what was that, last year when him and Rhett couldn't get on the same page as to how often, yeah. was that Cam Petway or was that Carry On? I think it was Cam Petway. If he was at practice, how much he practiced. So there's, they have a history of his history of contradicting his offensive coordinators. And that usually leads to the offensive coordinators not speaking to us anymore. <laughs> but uh, contractually, we'll get to speak to... Chip Lindsay and Kevin Steele one more time actually at the Peach Bowl site in late December here in a couple of weeks actually actually about two weeks from right now but uh or less than two weeks excuse me um it's strange to think that the the Peach Bowl's two weeks from Monday uh, well because they had just started listening. practicing on Friday and it's, then didn't yeah. practice Saturday so it's very strange that it seems in previous years preparation I mean starts earlier or just seemed more focused just a lot more time went into it I guess I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've been to other schools where they utilize as many practices as they can. And, Every minute, yeah. And they hold they held a scrimmage uh, Sunday night with the young guys. We didn't really get any details on that. But at other schools I've been at, they've usually even the ones that were closed, they would open up that scrimmage just to give fans something to talk about, um, to kind of get them excited for the bowl game, so mm. to speak, even though those players weren't playing. Yeah, and it was actually interesting to watch because you'd see these young guys they're they're playing their butts off because they saw it as an opportunity to prove themselves. So it was almost like a real game in that sense. Both sides were going at it. Maybe that happened today uh, behind closed doors. We didn't really get much information uh, from That's that. It's just that they scrimmaged, I guess, the last yeah. two practices with some of the younger so, guys. So and and scrimmage in Gus Malzahn's world might mean you know forty plays that are and situational what, flag football. Right, and no one's getting tackled. So, But that's the best news for Auburn going into this bowl game against uh, an incredibly explosive UCF offense, you know, ranking number, what, number one in the country or in the top three at least in a lot of categories. And going against a top ten Auburn defense, uh, that's a heck of a matchup. And I was putting together some uh, predictions from across the country. I've compiled 43 so far. Is there's some back and forth on whether Auburn will win it, uh, even though Auburn's a ten point uh, favorite in this game? It's, I just the question, the coaching situation there is just that makes me, my mind. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, it would be probably impossible to track. But as an entire staff left and then coached the game, because uh, usually you get a couple of holdovers or yeah, uh, but it's just a strange situation. So if people don't know, Nebraska hired Scott Frost. UCF named was it Troy Troy Walters Troy Walters their offensive Ralph coordinator as the interim coach. He was I think the last coach assistant that Scott Frost hired at Nebraska. He had hired the previous nine, and then that made ten because uh, 
UCF hired um, a Missouri's offensive coordinator. Is that correct? Ho- Hopel? Uh, as Josh Heupel Josh as Heupel the uh, head as coach. Josh Heupel as the uh, head coach. And so Walters left after that. And But then they agreed that the entire staff was going to stay on and coach the bowl game. Uh, but the staff's not there right now. They're recruiting. Uh, and so their practice situation is probably more up in the air than even Auburn's. But uh, very strange. And that would make me think, is there going to be focus? How? What's that going to be like? Because you have, have no concept. I mean, Auburn's had interim what linebacker coaches a couple of years and defensive coordinator. Interim coordinate, defense coordinator, yeah. Uh, but nothing like that on the scale of that. No. Where it's all 10 coaches are sort of basically placeholders for their uh, f- for their counterparts. Yeah, I mean, in. those coaches, to be quite honest, right at this very moment are more uh, focused oh, more on recruiting in Nebraska. in Nebraska and their future employment than they are about you preparing UCF for the bowl game. Now, I'm certain they'll give – they're going to give 110 percent, but maybe, maybe 90 percent. When they're there, but I mean, they're they're <laughs> focused know. right now on a dead period. You know, I mean, come, on, I mean, come on though. Yeah, but I mean, but right now on the couple what 48 hours before the national signing day, do you think they're thinking about heck no? Uh, what uh, they're what thinking about whether they can get a linebacker? Jerry Stidham's going to throw. No. Um, and kudos to them if they are actually are spending some time right now preparing for the game, whether it's watching film or something, but. The logistics of it just don't make sense to me. I think if anybody, any team's going to have a letdown in this, it's going to be UCF. Yeah. Um, how can you not with the situation they're in? And also they're undefeated and they're high scoring offense. So really they can't go any higher than what they've done. Right. They can only go down, which is interesting to me because when I mention these bowl picks, I keep seeing the argument is, is that Auburn's going to go in this down a little bit. I, I, I see it's going to be. I think it's the proximity to uh, like. Well, that, that and yeah. they've lost. They lost the SEC championship game, and they're not in the playoff. Personally, I think they might be more motivated than UCF because they've got their staff back. There's a lot of players that know they're probably playing their last game, not just seniors, but right. those going the NFL. Meanwhile, these UCF guys, they're going to be motivated, but will they be prepared? Is my question. Are they yeah. going to be properly prepared? And you just kind of wonder: Will everybody be on the same page when you're? You kind of think, me, you know, me. What about me right now? When you're thinking, you got a new coaching staff coming yeah. in, trying to impress somebody. It's you know, you're working harder to maybe uh, about your own game as opposed to the team because you've got to worry about the next coaching staff coming in. Um, to, and this will be how interesting would it have been if Gus left and it was both interim oh, staffs? Dude. I mean, that would be uh, strange. Ticket sales feeling. been very hard, though. I think UCF would have still sold them because there's Nebraska fans that are going to be at this game. Yeah, that'd be a great sidebar for someone to do. Uh, to do a story on Nebraska fans that are there because there are going to be quite a few Nebraska fans there. It's crazy. They haven't been to a bowl game. (laughs) They want to see their new coach, what kind of offense he's going to implement. I guarantee you there will be Nebraska fans there. And Auburn hasn't sold out their lawman yet. Uh, Still haven't, I don't think. Yeah, so. Um, um, You know what, though? I mean, I don't don't know. Auburn fans are probably wised up with the – the ticket market out there and they could get cheaper tickets mm, through right? Ticketmaster and Seat Geek and Vivid Seats and all that stuff cuz I mean you can go and get $150 seats right now but they're on the third level uh, on the upper okay. deck. You go on Ticketmaster and, and I don't know, keep them. talking, I'll look it up right now. Um, ticket prices are probably cheaper for I'm like sure a sure they're level. cheaper. They better be, I would think. But, you know, uh well, I'm just saying UCF did sell out in like less than 24 hours, so that's a but good didn't sign they do for that differently? Don't they handle their, the way they sell their stuff differently with like with boosters and everything? I don't know. I think they just open it up for everybody. That's what someone told me. I mean, I don't know that they sold their allotment. That's all I know. So it was 12. You know, how, okay, a bunch of tickets. So Seat Geek right now says tickets are available from 128 bucks, which is cheap. Well, I found some for 107. Um. And you've got tickets all over the lower bowl available. Yeah, so that, that makes are sense. that are cheaper. Um, and you got some on the second level that are one hundred seven dollars. Um, and I could tell you one thing: if these tickets don't start selling in the next week before Christmas, after Christmas, these tickets will drop. Without the solar eclipse deal at Auburn. <laughs> yeah, no solar eclipse glasses. I told you about yeah. I told you about how I covered one bowl game where the tickets were two cents. Yeah, and they still the day of the game. Um, I don't. I, I think it'll. There's no way this thing's gonna be sold out. No. I just don't think so. Well, they could be a sellout. 
a majority, right. I mean, the people listening but the, the, can't all see the seats are not going to be filled. It'll be like the Sugar Bowl last yeah, year. I mean, Sugar Bowl last year. Sugar Bowl wasn't sold out though. They were struggling to sell tickets. And it was Oklahoma and Auburn, two yeah. top name programs in the Big Easy, where you would like to go celebrate New Year's Eve. You know, right? And it still wasn't full. So I just I think so. that's where. But that's to, back to what your original point was: the letdown, where that they think. And it's sort of silly, like the these well, kids travel really all around s- anyway. Bowl games really sell out anymore, any, anyway, yeah, because but, bowl, the bowl game structure and the college football playoff, college football playoff games sell out. But, but you, the other bowl games never sell out. You've mentioned it. Auburn has more to lose in this game than UCF. I need to, I need to win this one. Uh, yeah. sure. What would they lose though? A lot of annoying fans being upset for, <laughs> for six months and questioning the yeah. offense. And yeah, you're right. I think and a two game losing streak with the possibility of losing a third. Uh, it's just it's, that would all be, Atlanta. All in Atlanta. The Atlanta curse now. Yeah, they should bring some cigars to the game. And smoke them <laughs> over well, Auburn's a ten point favorite. This game's weird. Um, I think we have uh, put that. Uh, to test already just do the ticket sales and the coaching situations and all that gus malzahn so gus malzahn's only won one bowl game and they haven't really started preparing for it like you said so it's hard to kind of get a gauge of what they even expect and we'll ask gus malzahn wednesday like what why are you doing things the way you are and you know you're not necessarily practicing as much maybe some rules have changed or something that i don't know about but shouldn't they be allowed 15 practices i thought it was 15 uh, at least i might be wrong but I'm pretty sure because I I remember. But they're not even going to come close to 15. They're going to get like eight no. or nine real practices in, and that's, eight at and, most. And that's that's well short of 15. So I mean, even if it's 10, they're still short of 10. So because uh, I mean, in the previous years they've done that. I mean, they've done even for the Sugar Bowl they did a lot more practices. Um, that's true. We had a week of more of availability and stuff, and so you just kind of time it to that. Um, yeah, I kind of thought that they would practice through like Friday. Or Saturday, yeah, and apparently they're not right? taking a break. They're taking a break right after, uh, yeah. And they had Thursday's the last practice, and they had here. Saturday off. So, uh, yeah. um, it's not yeah, it's they're weird. not going every day. Well, it's Saturday they usually do that because the team graduation, but and graduation. But I mean, I'm just saying it just shows that they're yeah. not. I mean, this wasn't sort of cram it all in. This was just sort of a comfortable skipping stone. Certainly, finals weeks affects things, but finals weeks are going on everywhere across the country. Anyway, we'll talk to Gus Malz on more Wednesday and try and figure out his approach with it and why he's taking that approach. Maybe he wants the kids fresh. I, I don't know. It's strange. Or maybe he just sees it as we're only gonna, you only can prepare for an opponent for so long. So more, rather than doing two weeks, we did a week and a half. I, I don't know. We'll see what he says. He probably won't say anything. Uh, the early signing period is coming up. We do not, you and I do not cover recruiting full time, but uh, we can say this. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more with Keith Niebuhr, our recruiting reporter, in another podcast uh, for Tuesday, uh, just about this early signing period. But Auburn's expected to sign like maybe up to twenty folks. So in essence, uh, it becomes signing day. Not it becomes February signing day signing now. Day, yeah. February signing day is a. The national holiday, so to speak, not going to be anymore. It's not going to be a national holiday. It's very strange. Um, but I was going to sign a lot of folks. Now we're not going to go through here and talk about all of them. But uh, what's interesting is how coaches are reacting as they get closer to this early signing period, and how it's affecting their workload, and also how they're having to handle things, and how the kids are having to handle things. Coaches, you got a lot of these players that are in the playoffs or just got done with the playoffs, and they've had to pick their school. Right before signing day, um, in this new signing day, instead of waiting till like January or February, uh, Nick Saban across the state of Alabama was sounded pretty frustrated when he was talking about it, saying he hasn't talked to one coach who likes it, which is interesting because the conferences are the ones who approve this. <laughs> How does it get out of conference? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But it's Nick Saban for you. I mean, he's the whatever. And uh, but Kevin Steele, and I'm sure a lot of coaches think this too, but Kevin Steele is going to be pretty forthright with you no matter what, was kind of saying, I don't quite understand like the need for it is kind of what he was saying. He doesn't necessarily see a lot of positives coming out of it, um, but he doesn't necessarily know if it's a negative, but he does know that it does put more pressure on the coach, he says he couldn't speak for the players and the other coaches in the high school level because he's not them. But he could speak on his own and say, 
you know, what really affected them is in the last three weeks of the regular season when they're preparing for Georgia, Louisiana, Monroe, and Alabama, and they're having to bring as many kids on campus as possible to get them on campus in front of them and then also decide whether they're going to sign with Auburn and secure that for this early signing period on in December. Now, what's the big deal about that? Well, consider this. What was it, the Georgia game? They had 50-plus four-star kids yeah. or better uh, on campus, similar number for the Iron Bowl. And for Auburn's coaches, that's great, sure. But what sucks for them is that on Fridays, they don't get to see them at all because the, they have to go to Montgomery where the team stays and the players that are visiting campus can't go to Montgomery to go visit with them. Right. They have to stay on campus. So for that entire Friday night, these kids are around town by themselves, really, not being shown or being ta- being able to talk to these coaches, and it kind of loses something there. And Auburn has to handle all their stuff recruiting-wise immediately after the game. They leave after they get done with the media and shower and do all that. They come back over here, go to the hotel, and go talk to kids, and it's like really a time crunch. And it's even more so now that this early signing period is in effect. Used to be if you couldn't get in front of a kid for too long – you had the entire month of December and January is when things really heated up and you could bring kids in for a full weekend and spend two, three days with them and have fun. They can't do that anymore right now. Well, I think one of the more uh, interesting lines he said was it hurts our ability to do evaluation and go through the critic process because it's not just think about they're going to lose out on a bunch of guys that month, you know, November and December, that next wave that their guys are trying to go next are they going to get the right guys? Are they are they having to kind of rush to choose somebody that maybe they don't want, but they want to fill a slot? Um, that was sort of the interesting kind of line to me, that the idea that um, are they going to be forced to make rash decisions because of they want to fill a certain amount of slots in a certain amount of time, and they're going up against competition, they're filling yep. up certain slots in a certain amount of time. That um, and And then, you know, he said there's a lot of unknown, and like – he said he's not going to be sure about the positives because he wants to go through it. I don't think you'll know because will you get people <laughs> regretting their decision? Will you get more people uh, seeking to get out of there? Like, I mean, what's the fallout after Wednesday? And I don't think you'll know right away. You'll have no. six or eight guys, I think six in this case, enroll early. Those guys would have enrolled early anyway. That's how it was in previous years. But then you've got 14 that are locked in and signed. Is there any difference for them in this process in the next two months? Do there, are there more people across the country that have regrets that mom and dad made a mistake or, to, you know, it's like, I, I don't, and cause they've rushed because they've tried to, they want to sign cause teams are pressuring them to sign early, you know? And I think that's what Kevin was talking about. He won't know what's good about it for months to come because you have to wait a couple more months to kind of see what the fallout is. Cause yeah. I don't think it stops Wednesday, Wednesday they sign, but then what happens after that? What's the what's the yeah, next step? Yeah, and what hurts worse, because as you mentioned, there's another signing period in February, the original national signing The original day. signing day, And yeah. there's going to be people that hold out for that, and those kids are going to be sitting back watching those ceremonies going, oh, I could have done this. Yeah. Or, Should I have waited? Why did I not wait? What's the fallout in the next couple of weeks? They, yeah, and that, there's yeah. no way to answer that. These are all hypotheticals, but. But it's interesting that he doesn't know how it's going to go. But you have to think of the way a kid, an 18-year-old, 17-year-old kid thinks. And 17-year-old kid thinks, should I have waited and made this a bigger thing for me or my family? Or did I make the wrong decision even though I feel like it's the right decision? I think think there could be... I think there could th- be issues that come up just with kids being feeling yeah, pressured yeah. to sign. And this and, is across college football, not just Auburn. Yeah, obviously. no, it's not Auburn. It's just in uh, general. And I think that's what he's talking about, just being worried about what the fallout is because you just don't know. You really don't. Um, let's go to basketball real quick. Auburn's 9-1 and one. for the first time since 1999. They they beat Middle Tennessee, what was it, 76-70. to 70. Mm-hmm. They led by 25. Got down um, to six in the final minute. I I'm going to hit on this real quick. You tell me what you think. Uh, Malik Dunbar's double text was dumb, and that changed the game. They were up, what, 22, 23 at the time, and that spurred Middle Tennessee to, one, get some free points off free throws, and then they went on their run. Very selfish act, and apparently he ripped his jersey off and all yeah, that. I didn't all see that. When he was walking the locker room, just not a good look, and it hurt the team a little bit. Auburn held on and won and got a top 15 RPI win. It's a nice win, but – 
goodness, if you're doing if you do that later in the season and it's a ten point game and you lose a game because of four free throws or yeah. two free throws and they go on a run, that's four, not good. It was, two, it was four free throws and the ball, and they missed the possession, so it would have been worse if they had it. Oh, out. that'd have been, uh, been a six point swing. But you know, Middle Tennessee as Auburn's. Auburn's offense kind of cooled down the second half, which was interesting. The defense actually was okay, but Middle Tennessee, one, another team once again melted an Auburn lead. Well, but Auburn held on. That's the big news for them, and it doesn't matter what happened. Auburn got the, the, the victory. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, UCF's comeback. Middle Tennessee's comeback yeah. uh, coincided with also Anthony McMore being in foul trouble and going to the right. bench. Uh, and I think that was the bigger deal. I mean, the 4 3 throws obviously cut the points off, but um, – there's a fine line with this team, and we've kind of talked about it, that if they're shooting threes, uh, they're winning games, and it's like a very streaky team. But the alternative is when they can't find offense, when Mustafa's not shooting well or Bryce isn't shooting well, Anthony gives them a little bit. Not much. Not much, because he's not a great kind of guy that can create, but he's got a little bit of a jump shot now, uh, shooting better. Um, and it does a lot of things. Horace has just really struggled, and uh, whatever – Solid preseason he has has kind of gone out the window, and offensively, he I saw him hit a nice shot against Middle Tennessee. Yeah, he hit some free throws, but offensively, he doesn't give them anything. Yeah, uh, he hasn't made that jump. I, a lot of us thought he would. Yeah, and he can't give it, and he's not a kind of real post player. Uh, Anthony's not either, but he gives them a, just a little bit. And he had two baskets, kind of in the first ten minutes, and kind of energized the team and had a jump shot. And uh, I think that's kind of big because, gosh, he's like one of the you know. Chuma, him, maybe the third option on this team behind yeah. Mustafa and yeah. Bryce. Uh, Jared at times, but they don't want him to be that kind of player. And Jared's had to be that player. And, but he has. But, but, they, but at certain times, they, like at the end of the game, they wanted him to be. And, and when yeah. they need him at the beginning of the game. But middle game, they want him distributing. And so you're kind of looking at it. Where do they get offense? And, uh, man, when Anthony was on the bench, uh, they couldn't do anything because they weren't hitting shots. What's so, helping them even when they go cold is the rebounding. They've rebounded better. Yeah, right? they're a better rebounding team this year than I, th- I thought they were going to be, especially without Austin Wiley yeah. uh, out there, which is... But so if they win one more out of this three-game stretch, they'll be in a pretty good position. Um, and they're favored. They should, they're going to be favored uh, in all these uh, three remaining games. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the line is. According to the but, ESPN, yeah. FPI, or whatever so, you want. Uh, yeah, they go to Murray, Murray State. State's the toughest game technically on the schedule yeah, then you at home Murray this State. Weekend. Well, then Cornell to finish out a conference. So. UConn, I think their schedule is a little deceiving. They only have three losses. One of them was by like 30-something to Arkansas, and then the others were kind of close. Yeah. Syracuse, which is good, but a lot of people have written them off, and just be, and their RPI is low. That that could be a dangerous game. It's, well, it's coming off a three-game st- stretch where two of those games are kind of on the road. One's neutral, but yeah. well, that could be a game where you kind of worry about a letdown, especially two days before Christmas and the holidays. Right. Um, kind of having the guys focused, but Auburn has a shot here to be twelve and one entering the SEC, and yeah, to say crazy. that without Wiley and Dangel is uh, something, regardless of the schedule. To be quite honest, yeah. Um, and they're you know one losses against a Temple team that was maybe still is in the top ten RPI wise. Yeah. So, uh, but now the question is, we'll, I don't know if we'll get Bruce before here this game, but what is going to happen with these? The semester over. Now's the time to ask. Yes, and we'll get to that in listener questions, but I'll, I'll hint, we we don't know. Um it's uh it's the mystery that keeps on mystering. Uh let's go ahead and go to listener questions. Let's do that. Uh here on the Auburn Undercover podcast. Let's scroll through on my Twitter machine. See what human beings are saying. I believe these are all human beings. Okay. First one is from Raj he asked, why, why, why can't we get Wiley and Purifoy back? Well, because they have, oh, there's a federal indictment that alleges that they t- their families took money uh, from Chuck Person. That's why. Um, I think that's the stumbling block. But I really think that that's what it comes down to. And it will continue to be that till we hear something. But with it being in the end of the semester, the kids have some power to make a decision of their own. Well, yeah. they got to decide now with basically the out of conference schedule done. How many games are they going to realistically play if they're not kind of if there's no timeline for getting cleared in the short term? And it's a hard question to ask because you can make a couple bucks, right, going overseas, right? 
and showcase your talents because that's the other thing part of it especially for dangel i think austin can get drafted just by his size alone um where dangel has something to prove still yeah austin i mean like teams are going to take a chance on a guy that's built like that uh no question Sean asks, where does Carrion Johnson rank in Auburn history? It's Bo Jackson, and then who else? Oh. Um, well, listen, Carrion Johnson's had one really good year, and it was 10 games. So it's tougher for me to put him in the top four or five. Having said that, my top two or three would look like Bo, uh, then Trey Mason, you're a big Trey guy. I'm a big Trey guy. And that was just one year kind of like carry on too. But, man, he what he did was phenomenal and wasn't getting hurt. And when he was getting hurt, he didn't look hurt. You might um, never see a stretch run like that that he had at the no. end of that season. Um, Probably not. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, you go into the SEC championship game banged up and you break the SEC championship game record uh, for rushing. Yeah. I mean, no one does that. Um, especially against a that, that. By the way, that Missouri defense was top five in rush defense leading in that game. Um, and so was the Alabama defense he just faced the week before. Um, but at, beyond Trey, you can make a case for a lot of folks. Caddy, Ronnie. Uh, uh, I don't know if you put Carry on the top five though. Well, then you got James Brooks and Joe Critch up there with careers. Yeah. Uh, uh, 3,000. And, 3, and what they did after Bo, I mean, it can't be uh, overlooked because, um, I mean, what they did was incredible. So I don't think you put Carry on Johnson in the top five. If he came back next year and rushed for 1,400, 1,500 yards again, well, we would revisit that, um, but not not right now. I think if he comes back, he has a chance of putting himself second if he had a phenomenal season. Like Heisman worthy? Yeah. Sure, maybe, yeah, yeah. But yeah. right now, I think you'd put him in the top ten and say he had, uh, yeah, uh, and especially what could have been if he stayed healthy, maybe the entire run uh, could have been easily top five. But those injuries kind of set him back a little bit. Yep. Uh, Rusty asked, "What is the latest on the athletics director search?" I don't have anything for you right now. That could change this week. I just know it was supposed to ramp up last week. I have not heard any names, and I think the reason why is because. Uh, the president's office is handling most of this. And to be quite honest, sports writers don't have a lot of connections in the president's office, especially when the president's office is uh, a new president. Um, so we'll, we'll email see. Email him. Uh, my suggestion, if you're a fan, email <laughs> him and ask what's going on and say you're a big fan. And, you know, uh, I think you might get an answer because that's apparently the way to get in touch with them. Apparently so. Reporters can't get a hold of them. But fans, you just email him anything. He will he will just talk off his well, the best mind. part about the emails back was they were sent sent from my ipad at the bottom yes yeah, sent from my ipad sent from my t90x uh is that a calculator which one's a calculator t90 isn't t9, it i don't know i don't know what the x is there is it like a terminator yeah that's terminator 90 coming soon to a theater near you uh memphis spence asked did bruce pearl know what chuck was doing and should he have known uh, we don't know. Those are two separate questions. But so. should he have known? Yeah. One could argue against that uh, for that. I mean, technically, the head coach is responsible for his staff. It, early on in this investigation, a lot of people thought, hey, that's why Bruce Pearl's in a lot of hot water. One, because he was coming off a of show cause himself, was getting second life in the NCAA and being able to coach. And then now his top associate head coach is, uh, you know, in j- a jail cell or whatever, you know. Uh, or being carried away in handcuffs from his home yeah. in the FBI investigation. It's not a good look for someone who was coming off a show cause. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Things were really hot and heated, what, a month ago? Things have cooled down a lot, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens after the season with Bruce um, and and his staff and everything. And if there's other revelations on the federal case as, as it unfolds, uh could obviously impact things. Uh, Joe asks, any new con- any word on new contracts for Chip Lindsay and Kevin Steele? No, but they're in the works. Uh, I believe Kevin Steele is going to be paid handsomely. He's already making about, what, 1.2 or something like that? Over a million. Uh, he'll probably be making more than a million and a half. 
I would it's good money if you can get it. Very good money. Um, Kyle Hatcher asks, what assistant coaches do you think could leave for other opportunities? Thanks for the great job you guys do at AUC. Merry Christmas. Well, thanks, Kyle. Happy holidays to you, too. Um, as of right now, I don't see any coaches leaving. I think that's kind of come and pass at this point, unless some big program wants to hire one of the coaches here, a position coach as a 10th coach, and make them like a coordinator or something. But I, I don't see that happening. Uh, most mm-hmm. of these programs are going to hire a 10th coach are going to do – you know, position stuff. They're not going to hire a coordinator. Right. Um, so I think things are kind of calmed down with that. Um, Unless there's some opening that happens otherwise. Right. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, some of these other openings that have happened, like UCA, I thought, you know, maybe Tim Horton could do at Central Arkansas because his dad was a le- his legend there and he'd go back to his home state. That closed up quickly. They hired someone. Uh, a lot of these jobs are have filled up. So... <clears throat> Um, let's see. A lot of Austin Wiley questions. A Justin Ross question. Wrong person to ask. A lot of people on Bruce Pearl's side. We'll end with this. This isn't really a question, but it's at least entertaining. Jordan Martin asks, or says, when is the joke of an internal investigation going to be over? Hmm. Obviously, they cannot find anything. Exclamation point. President at Auburn needs to step up with a set of balls and end this. Do you think like 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 an, like two basketballs like holding and I go, hey guys? I it's just a matter of that they. I don't. Know, it, it's hard. <laughs> Look, <laughs> there's a federal complaint against them that alleges certain things, and you can't erase that. And that's that in and of itself evidence of enough guilt that would declare them ineligible. Uh, and it's probably a stumbling block. It's not if they can find something that's guilty. Uh, maybe it's that they can't find enough to exonerate them to be able to sort of say we're declaring them eligible or we're declaring them eligible. But um, I just think it's that they're in a tough spot. Uh, ha- I don't think they're being transparent, and I don't think that they're being fair to anybody kind of involved. I think that – Including um, uh, the two coaches who were let go. Right. Well, not let go, put on indefinite. Not not yet, yeah. yeah. Indefinite leave. Me. Uh, Frankie Sullivan, not including Chuck Person. Frankie but. Sullivan, uh, we updated that last week, has still not heard why he was yeah. put on leave, which is astounding. Um, you know, look, there's been major missteps. I don't know necessarily if not playing them has been one of them. If they can't, find if they them. can't find anything, or they just aren't clear. Uh, Bruce Pearl said last night on SEC Network Saturday night after the game was all like, you know, we're in the process, we're hopeful, and all this. How much longer can you say that? I guess as long as they're here on campus. You got to remain hopeful publicly or or they'll be out the door the second you say otherwise. That's true. uh, What advice are they getting too? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what, because at this point, if you're somebody, uh, if you're looking out for the best interests, are there best interests to sit? Yeah. And here's the other thing, folks. Listen, if the FBI allegations are true, how do you fight that? That they receive thousands, their families receive thousands of dollars. Do you say that the kids didn't know, and you disband uh, or, or disaffiliate, unaffiliate yourself with the families, kind of like they did with Cam Newton's father uh, seven years ago, and then let the players play? That's a possibility. But also, are they going to pay the money back? Is that money exactly what the the allegations are said to be? Was there more money? Auburn's got to do its own investigation, then go the NCAA with that stuff. The NCAA is not calling the shots here. Auburn's compliance is with an affiliation with the Auburn president's office. Jay Jacobs, the athletics director, has made it very clear he's not involved in any of this. He's about as involved as you and you and I are. Yeah. So that's probably something else that's really screwing things up, that you don't have There's an no athletics guiding director's voice. voice. The guiding hand that yes. says, we need to here's here's the three things that need to happen or here's what we need to do if we can't clear them we need to release them or we can't if we can't clear them we need to put out a statement saying you know there's no um it's it's a mess in the sense that there's no sort of uh, overarching kind of goal or message that's being put out or um you know bruce has been kind of left to fend for himself on it um and that's another problem I, and i i think that's i think why people are frustrated um they see what they're doing and don't kind of like that it's all falling on his shoulders 
Uh, and I don't think a lot of people blame him for Chuck Person's actions. And that's kind of, I think, what maybe the tone of the question is about specifically, too. Yeah. Well, uh, it's just same I mean, old, I guess the old. don't get named in an FBI report. Yeah, don't do that. Then then you'll be able to play. Especially with wiretaps. Yeah, and video. And vid- video video, and audio surveillance. Uh, it's hard to get around, I'd yeah. imagine. Yeah. They've got hours of it. Hours of videotape. And then audio and phone calls. and Actual videotape, not, actual not videotape. digital. Oh, I mean, I I'm sure know. it's digital. <laughs> so it's Betamax. Betamax. They're, they're, Betamax remember, the FBI clear. is in shambles from what I hear, so... <laughs> This has been the Auburn Undercover Podcast presented by WeHaveDonuts.com.